as a seminar today I said I'd be happy to do so but as it happens the seminar date is the same day as the 15th anniversary of the uh, adoption of the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities by the UN General Assembly. So why don't we start with a brief kind of exchange from some people who have been involved with that to sort of mark the occasion and move from that into the research seminar. So things today, <coughs> excuse me, are going to be uh, in two parts, really. The first part, about 30 minutes or so, will be um, a bit of a reflection on the drafting of the convention and the impact that it's had since that time. And then after about a half hour, we'll move into the, uh, the more academic research piece. And I'll step back from, uh, from the discussion. So with that, can I ask my fellow speakers to, uh, to put on their cameras and ask other people who are not speaking to keep their cameras off for now? Great, great. I'm still not seeing Janet Lord. Tim, I would just uh, make a quick, uh, just for the- That's okay, I'm sure Janet will join us. And- uh, just to make sure uh, for the speaker. And so let's just go ahead. I'm sorry, my, I'm just very busy on my screen trying to read the captioning and having people pop in and out and stuff like that. I, uh, I feel like I've got attention deficit disorder here or something. Anyhow, folks, welcome to the, uh, the seminar. Delighted that you're here with us today. As I said, my name is Steve Esty. I'm um, a disability rights advocate, I guess you would say, from Halifax in Nova Scotia. But a long time ago, when I was a young man, I was involved with the drafting of the, uh, the CRPD. And when I say involved, I was kind of a fly on the wall, while all kinds of smart government lawyers like Andrew Begg and others did the real work, and we goofed off in the halls of the UN. And that happened from 2002 to 2006. And then on December 13th, 2006, member states of the, of the UN General Assembly gathered and um, the convention was adopted by the UN on this day 15 years ago. Quite frankly, I had no idea what that was going to mean at that time at all. And I had even less idea 20 years ago when the government of Mexico moved the motion in the General Assembly to set up a committee to uh, consider whether or not there should be a convention. That happened on December 3rd, 2002. So it's a big month for anniversaries around the CRPD. And I'm just delighted to be here with three extremely distinguished uh, colleagues to discuss this. Um, and as I was saying to Senator Pettyflair as we were gathering, you know, quite frankly, I'm surprised that you folks have agreed to join me on such short notice. So I'm, I'm very delighted and, and quite honored to have you here. You've all provided me with, um, with uh, little bios. <coughs> But in the way of the world, my printer jammed, and I don't have those bios in front of me right now. So I'm going to wing it, and if I tell any lies, you can correct me, okay? Um, we've got three people here who approach the drafting and the convention implementation from very different perspective, perspectives. And I thought it would be interesting to just draw folks together and reflect on that. So we're first of all joined by Canadian Senator Chantal Petitclair. Senator Petitclair, well known to folks in the disability community and beyond here in Canada, as one of our foremost uh, Paralympic athletes. And um, in recent years, she's uh, 
become a member of Canada's Senate and has had tremendous influence and impact on the lives of people with disabilities in that role over the last four or five years. I've had occasion to meet with the Senator on a number of things, most notably in this context, a few times at conferences of states parties to the CRPD in New York City. So I think that she has a really unique perspective on the impact of the convention on parliament for on parliamentarians and i welcome her views as we go forward today along with this we're joined by andrew big who i haven't seen in flesh for 15 years if not more so andrew i'm just delighted to see you and uh, to see you having weathered so well with all the miles you've had on you since those days because andrew worked in those days for the foreign ministry of the government of New Zealand as a, uh, as a legal advisor. And in that capacity, he supported the um, New Zealand ambassador to the UN, Don McKay, who was the chair of the ad hoc committee from the time of the working group in 2004 until we drew things to a, a really interesting close in the summer of 2006. And Andrew really worked very, very closely, not just with government, but with those of us in the great unwashed NGO world as well. And Andrew's dedication to the cause was tested on many occasions. And I think that probably the best example of this is that Andrew agreed to travel unbeknownst to what he was getting himself into to Winnipeg in the summer of 2005 or 2006. He uh, prepared to, to brave the, uh, the wilds of the Canadian prairie in the summer to talk about the CRPD with disability advocates from around the world at a DPI conference. So he did that and many, many other things. We got to be quite good friends over those days and I'm quite delighted to have you here with us again today. And I'm going to step back for a second and maybe ask Andrew and Chantal to speak a little bit just about yourselves. And I'm going to go off camera and see if I can find Janet, because I'm sure she's trying to get online. So I'm sure Chantal and Andrew that you don't need me. So take it away. OK, I'll be right back. I believe we have the floor, Andrew. I'm not sure if you wanted me to <laughs> to go first. Yes, please go ahead. Uh, I, I will defer to uh, to um, uh, seniority, and and I think the senator usually trumps <laughs> the official. And uh, so, as an official, I will always let the senator go first. Oh, well, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, uh, and and thank you, Steve, uh, for having me. Uh, today it is. Uh, I mean, it was. Uh, I, I remember uh, so fondly uh, uh, the first time that I was in New York and that we met, and I was a newly appointed senator, and it was uh, very uh, eye-opening for me to be at that event at that time and have this opportunity to connect with you and and others and have a, a little bit of a crash course. Uh, on on the rights for persons with disability and uh, which maybe I shouldn't have needed it but uh, the reality was that uh, I came from the Paralympic world and I was entering a new um, a new sphere I suppose uh, being a becoming a parliamentarian and 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 being more made aware of what uh, it meant to be an activist and to fight for the rights of persons with disabilities. So today I will speak very briefly, uh, just to say that it's a pleasure, it's a privilege to be here uh, at this event. I'm mostly looking forward to listening because uh, I am sure that I will find it very uh, interesting, but also, let's be honest, useful for me uh, as my, uh, you know, uh, as a senator and for, for the role that I have on Parliament Hill. I want to say that uh, when I was reflecting this morning on this um, uh, 15th anniversary of the UN adoption of the, the, 
the CRPD, uh, it really made me reflect on, on how far we've come. And, and I thought about it, obviously, because of my past life, I thought about it first as a Paralympian, as a, uh, an athlete with a disability, and remembered when I did begin Paralympic sport uh, at the beginning of the 80s, and this was the big years of André Vigée and Rick Hansen, and how everything had to be pushed and every door had to be open and how much we had to to fight to be recognized as athletes and even athletes like myself but like rick Hansen, you know would break a world record and everybody tended to just uh, give him a little pat on the shoulder and um and tell him how courageous he was uh and and even i was reflecting this morning on the evolution of the language when it came to athletes and persons with a disability. And back then, like I said, it was all about courage. It was all about uh, first being uh, handicapped and even uh, uh, um, infirm. I remember traveling the world and being so offended by, by the word and the vocabulary that was used when, when, when people described myself and how this evolved into, you know, going from, from handicap to persons with <laughs> handicap, persons with a disability, uh, and now persons living with a disability. And I find that this evolution of language is very much revealing on a change of mindset and culture and an evolution on the rights of person with disability, which I believe is very positive. And when I look at, uh, you know, our Canadian team came back from Tokyo a few months ago with, of course, medals, but recognition, recognition in the media, recognition by the government, recognition by sponsors. Tokyo was also a groundbreaking event with the International Paralympic Committee deciding that they wanted to be a part of that uh, human rights movement, we the 15, we the 15% of the population living with a disability. And so part of me feels very, very proud and very optimistic when I look at how far we've come. And at the same time now, being on Parliament Hill, being a senator, looking at the numbers and looking at the numbers through um, this pandemic, well, yes, of course, we have the medal of our Paralympians and they are recognized and, and it's so amazing and it's so great. But we also have to recognize that uh, even here in Canada, the percentages of persons with disability struggling to find a job uh, and when they do find a job, uh, struggling to be uh, decently paid for that job. And, and when I look at how much uh, left is to be done when it comes to having uh, your rights respected, uh, to have access to work, to education, to care, to, you know, to the tools that you need to have, uh, you know, to fulfill the life and to live the life that you want and that you have the right to live in a country like Canada as a person with a disability, well, then I realized that there is so much, so much work that needs to be done. And, and I guess, you know, we would do this meeting in five years and I would have the same speech saying, so much has been done when we look back, but we're not there yet. Uh, and, and unfortunately, I think, in five years, we're going to be the saying the same thing. So much has been done, but we're not there yet. And maybe in 10 years, but uh, to me, it's, you know, it, it really is, it is the, 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 the proof that, uh, well, that this uh, fight uh, and that uh, speaking, that being there, that we, it, it's worth it. It's important. Uh, and when I look at, uh, every stakeholder has a role to play. Uh, and so I guess, you know, what I can say in come before I let you speak, Andrew, is that, uh, well, I commit to do the role that I can do uh, in the Senate. And I know that you will, you know where to find me if I need to know something. 
And I am uh, very, very grateful because I know that uh, you two will be uh, playing and are playing your role today when it comes to making sure that uh, uh, respecting the rights of persons with disability is something that uh, we all uh, still have to work for and, and we're committed to do it. So thank you. And thank you for having me. Thank you very much, Senator. Appreciate those comments and reflections, really helpful. Um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to locate myself on the Zoom screen here. Um, I haven't been able to find Janet, something must have come up. I know she was keen to participate and we were emailing just moments before things. So I've written to her and said, I hope all is well. And I, so I think we've got a, only about 10 or 15 minutes left here. And that's, that's fine. Andrew, I wonder if you and I might just have a little bit of a chat more about the, the drafting process and things. I think Senator Petty Clear has made clear, you know, some of the impact in the long term. But I mean, we met first in 2002, 2003, um, at the meetings of the Ad Hoc Committee. I think that, that uh, Ambassador McKay took over as chair from uh, Ambassador Gallegos at the time of the working group meeting in January of 2004. Is that correct? Uh, yes, the, the exact date, um, I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but for, for a while there was an overlap. Um, but I think what I'd, what I'd like to uh, reflect on is, is, is to, um, to, to build on one of the things that um, Senator Petty Clerk had, had mentioned at the beginning of her, her um, intervention where uh, she recalled the uh, the move of the terminology and uh, and the mindset that that reflected and, and and that made me think of really one of the key aspects of the drafting process was right at the beginning where um, disability issues uh, to me and everybody else in the, in, in the UN were something that wasn't looked at as a human rights issue uh, it was looked at as a social issue. And you could see that just by looking at the agenda of the UN. Um, there are, there are, there's a number of different commissions that all report up to uh, ultimately to the General Assembly. The Commission on Human Rights was one that's now been replaced by the Human Rights Council. There was also the Commission on the Status of Women. And both of those meetings were very well attended. NGOs would fly in from all around the world uh, the meetings were standing room only. Um, for the Commission on Human Rights, which met in Geneva, all of the New York human rights delegates would fly to Geneva. And then when the General Assembly considered human rights issues, all of the Geneva delegates would fly to New York. You had these very, very well attended meetings. Uh, NGOs from all over the world would, uh, would attend. And then the Commission on Social Development which was where the disabilities agenda item sat. Uh, there was barely anyone in the room. No one came. Uh, there was no uh, NGOs, not even the delegates would, uh, would show up. You'd, you'd go into the room and there'd be a few interns and, and one or two member states, uh, very, very poorly attended. And uh, that, that really got a, 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 a kick when, the Mexicans ran a resolution in the General Assembly to start discussing the convention as a human rights issue. Uh, then we dragged it off the agenda of, of social development and we put it on the agenda under human rights. And that was a fight uh, in itself, but that started the ball rolling. And, uh, and then we started to see the disabled people's organizations coming to the UN. Um, and, and the traditional human rights organizations, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, uh, et cetera, they, they didn't really have um, talking points. They, they, they hadn't considered disability as part of their mandate. So they sat at the back of the room. Um, Andrew, can I jump in here? Absolutely. And just, uh, and just, I don't mean to cut you off at all, but I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. 
And I just wanted to go back a step farther on this because in the mid 90s, I was involved in a process that predated the drafting of the CRPD. And that's something that Canadians will be familiar with. And that is the, uh, the Anti-Personnel Landmine Treaty, that so-called Ottawa Convention. And in that Ottawa Convention, there is a provision around victim assistance. And I was involved with the drafting of that. And it was the first time in any humanitarian uh, convention that there was a specific mention of people with disabilities as victims or in any way, shape or form. So it's exactly as you were saying, it always been considered something entirely separate from a human rights issue or even a humanitarian issue. It was a kind of a, a nice thing that some interns did, as you say. So it was a real mind shift. And I remember those days in 2002 and 2003. I mean, quite frankly, I was there as an NGO and I watched governments from around the world, including the government of Canada, try very hard to put the brakes on the whole CRPD development process because they were very concerned about the financial implications that this would have in terms of actual monitoring and implementation and all of these things. So the whole of the meeting in 2002 and 2003, those ad hoc committee meetings were, are we gonna have one or are we not gonna have one? And only at the end of the 2003 meeting, did we get it together and say, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a working group to draft a document so that we actually have some sense of what we're talking about. And that's the working group that met in January of 2004 that you and Ambassador McKay were so central to. And for me, as a human rights disability advocate, that's where the thing shifted. Because instead of becoming a question of whether we're gonna have a convention, we're not going to have a convention. It became a question of, well, we've got this great draft convention. How can we improve it? So it became not a question of yes or no, but a question of yes and how can we improve it? And to me, that the kind of almost ontological shift that took place in the in the, the process. And I think that you know, as someone who's been very close to this for 20 years, it's been really quite astonishing to me to see the evolution of things over the course of time. As always, I've spoken too long and I'm going to stop at that. We're coming close to an end. I don't know if Senator Petty Claire is still with us. If you want to bring your camera back on, she's welcome to. But and I, I'm mystified as to where uh, where Janet is. Uh, I hope she's okay. But Andrew, I, I will say this: I don't get a lot of your time these last fifteen years or so. So I welcome uh, to to give you the floor for the last few minutes that we we have here together. I'm always interested in what you have to say. Um, sure, I, I, I have to say, I, I agree with your points um, that, that the shift happened when we got a draft together. Before that, uh, the traditional government delegates were afraid of the idea of a convention because uh, a lot of them thought that this would turn into some sort of a social development treaty. Uh, and therefore it would turn into a development, international development assistance question, and it would just be expensive. It would be a, a way for uh, the rich Western countries to be asked to give money to, uh, to developing countries. So there was a lot of fear, but once we got a text on the table, then the conversation became one about human rights. And the um, real intellectual push behind that was because we had the disabled people's organizations in the room. That was uh, the thing that, that New Zealand insisted on doing was that we wouldn't draft anything without uh, disabled people at the table. Um, and the people, uh, disabilities, um, the, uh, the disabled people's organizations hadn't been at the table at that until that point. And we had 
uh, secured funding so that when we were doing the drafting in that working group, sitting at the table were all of the people who were living the experience um, of living with a disability. And those voices were uh, incredibly powerful and very hard to ignore. And the stories that, uh, that, that, that they told in terms of their experience um, in combination with human rights lawyers meant that we could frame that discussion as one of a discussion about dignity and rights and not a question about uh, victimhood and, and assistance and charity. So um, then once we got those experiences into a draft convention, it made the conversation all about improving the text and making it consistent with the other human rights treaties that we already had. And, and then uh, the process took off um, and we had opened the door to having um, disabled people's organizations at the table um, because the, the message had been from all of those organizations, nothing about us without us. And uh, so New Zealand and, and a few other countries just took that and ran with it. And so we had um, throughout the process, the highest level of participation by the people whose rights we were discussing of any human rights treaty and and i think that's what made it such a strong outcome and um what made the drafting process uh, only take five years that sounds like a long time but the previous human rights treaty uh, the convention on the rights of the child that had taken 10 years to negotiate so we did it in five and we did it in five because we had the input and the active participation of all the people, um, all the disabled people's organizations and, and NGOs from around the world. And, and I have to make one correction, Steve. I know you said um, earlier that you were a fly on the wall, but I think your role was much, much greater than that. You may have, <laughs> you may have been a fly on the wall in the meetings, but the fact that we managed to get this drafting done in five years was because all of those um, went back to their home countries in between that we had two meetings per year and, and in between each meeting, there was a massive amount of work done by the disabled people's organizations to coordinate positions, <laughs> to get instructions in front of their governments so that um, when the government delegations came, they came with very clear instructions to support uh and and, and um, detailed instructions to 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 negotiate the detailed provisions of the convention and uh that's why we made such good progress and it, it just simply wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't been for all of the ngos pushing their governments hard in capitals and then i know that you had a very large part in and um and it wouldn't have happened without people like you doing that and uh so I think you need to give yourselves uh, a lot, a lot more credit. The reason we were there negotiating in the first place was because disabled people's organisations got organised and then coordinated internationally, and uh, and, and 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 that yeah. amount of well, Andrew, we Canadians are like New Zealanders, just naturally modest folks, you know. So I appreciate that. We've been granted a five-minute reprieve by. Uh, by our convener, Kiko, to take questions. So if folks have questions, uh, very briefly, I'd invite you to click on your camera and, uh, and share them. But we don't have time for a lot, of, a lot of long questions. What I will say, though, before doing that is that while today is the 15th anniversary of the opening of the convention, in mid-March will be the 15th anniversary of the date that we opened it for signature. And I'd like to propose to folks here that we plan a little bit more to have a bit more of a celebration at that time, a bit more than a quick Zoom call to, uh, to talk about things. And, uh, and maybe with a little bit more planning, we can... Uh, we can have a, a bit more of a discussion and things. Anyway, the floor is open if anybody wants to make a quick observation uh, or take Andrew to task for anything.
I, I will invite, I know that uh, Senator Leclerc had to leave, but uh, if anyone has any uh, comments or questions uh, to Andrew or to Steve, um, that would be the time before we get into our next uh, portion of the meeting. Uh, you can also use the chat uh, if you want to, uh, to ask any, any points. But let me just say then, if, uh, if folks don't want to engage, that's fine. But I'm happy to, uh, to follow up if people have questions and so on. And I'd say again how delighted I am that Andrew was able to join us. And perhaps with a little bit more foresight, we can do something a little bit better the next time around. I didn't say when I introduced Andrew that he's gone on to some other things since his days working with us at the ad hoc committee and is now working back in New York um, at the UN at headquarters, but has worked in Africa and in Europe with different UN agencies in the intervening years. And Andrew is now back in New York and working with the Security Council at the UN. So Andrew, I don't know what March will bring in terms of the pandemic and all the horrors attached to it, but perhaps we, God willing, will find ourselves in the same country and in the same room, which would be a real pleasure for me. So allow me to thank you again for joining us and to thank Kiko and her colleagues for allowing us this opportunity to, uh, to acknowledge this significant anniversary here today. I hope that you found it of some use and some interest. I've enjoyed our little time together and I look forward to the next part of the program. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much, Steve. And uh, just before we uh, let uh, the, the, the end of the first part go, um, Anthony, perhaps if you could uh, share with us, uh, Andrew, sorry, for, uh, for a second, uh, what is the role, and that moves us to the next uh, part, what do you think uh, is a significant role for, you said, you mentioned that uh, DPOs were important, fundamental in the drafting of the convention. How can people engage, like the, the common citizen, people who may not be affiliated to disability persons organizations, but as uh, here, I see on the room, uh, on the room we have a lot of uh, researchers, we have uh, families uh, of uh, children with disabilities who may not be part of an organization, but have different pieces to contribute. If you have any thoughts on ways that people can engage or have engaged in the past and could continue contributing. Uh, certainly, I, I, I had a sense 15 years ago when the negotiations wrapped up and the convention was adopted that uh, although there was a lot of celebration and rightly so, that this was now then the beginning of the work. Uh, Negotiating a, a treaty is, is one thing. It was a lot of work and, and I was incredibly privileged to be involved in it. But um, the work really starts once the convention is adopted. And that's where uh, the, the torch gets passed from those of us in New York to all of the, uh, the people who are affected by the convention on the ground in their communities. And um, to make human rights a reality for every human rights treaty, not just the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, but for all of them, it really takes a massive amount of work at grassroots level to make sure that, um, that leaders, politicians, governments, um, their feet are held to the fire to implement the provisions and make the rights within them a reality. And that happens at every level, national level, at the federal level, provincial level, local government level, with businesses and with community organizations. Um, a lot of it is awareness raising and, uh, and grassroots. Um, so th just, just because you're not in New York, uh, that's not, um, or Geneva, that's not really where the action happens. It happens where you live. And, uh, and I would encourage everybody to, um, to, to keep aware of, of the local politics um, and whether the, uh, the local politicians, councillors, um, board members of, of boards of education, uh, at, at really at every level, everywhere where there's somebody elected, uh, those people need to be aware of, 
of the convention and the fact that it has been ratified by Canada or, or whichever country uh, you live in um, to make sure that people are, are living up to the, the, the promise and, and to speak out where, uh, where it isn't. This is fantastic. Thank you so much. And this is uh, indeed uh, the perfect segue to um, to uh, I'm inviting the, the, our next speaker, um, Rachel uh, Martins, who um, has been working uh, in this like on the floor of engagement. Uh, she's an engagement strategist with uh, Ken Child uh, Center for Child Disability Research and Kids Bring Health Network. Uh, and she has been supporting family members and researchers as they learn to partner in different research projects, but also in advocacy. Rachel has uh, spoken at two uh, UN Conference of the States Party side events mm -hmm. and uh, has met with the CRPD committee in Geneva as well and leads a number of knowledge mobilization initiatives uh, in Canada. So right here where the action is taking place. And uh, she has a high interest in federal and provincial disability policy and uses writing as a tool for advocacy. Um, thank you, Rachel. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Rachel Martins and I'm from Calgary, Alberta. The subject of the UNCRPD has been a rather uncommon topic of conversation within parenting communities for a number of years in Canada. I, much like many other Canadian families, had an intuitive understanding that raising my child was a task that would go unsupported in many ways. And the cutie in the photo there as well is my son. The source of barriers were numerous and the tools for advocacy were few. In connecting within parenting communities, the conversations were always framed within the context of school boards, writing letters to political leaders and the media. The message being brought forward was often a moral one, which in principle is fine, deserved a framework based in the CRPD, reflecting goals for health and a full life. Goals that any parent strives to support building in their kids. The idea of filing a human rights complaint for many families was a part of their advocacy toolbox. Either it presented too many barriers to successfully feel that they could file a complaint or they were entirely unaware that they had the right to seek such help. The COVID-19 pandemic has offered an opportunity for increased education about the CRPD with families. With a world that has struggled with disinformation, this offered space to provide clarity and point families in the right direction for support. Where prior to the pandemic, there were cracks in the system, these cracks in many contexts became cavernous. You will, of course, hear more about the thoughts and feelings of Canadian families and youth in today's dialogue. Disability support organizations in many respects tried their best in ways in the best ways possible to fill in the gaps. However, some could not be remedied, like having support people in the home. In some cases, particular policies left children and youth at increased risk, where particular healthcare systems had vaccination mandates. Home care for children in some areas saw no such mandate. So workers who decided not to get vaccinated could find work with children. In some cases, families were told they weren't allowed to ask staff what their vaccination status was. So they either took the risk of having someone in their home or they made the stressful decision to go on their own. I did witness some incredible moments where people came together to bring clarity in heartbreaking situations. 
Twitter became a space for people to reach out and connect. When a young woman who cared for her young brother with Down syndrome found herself desperate to be a support but was denied access to him in the hospital after he got diagnosed with COVID, multiple organizations and Canadian families reached out and helped her advocate for being a support by his side. For Canadian families that have been introduced to the concept of the CRPD, it's easy to see they envision it as a framework that could aid in the development of realistic policies that ensure safety, security, health, and a full life across the lifespan of their children. They just aren't seeing the impact in their lives quite yet at the scale that it deserves to occupy within their lives. The emergence of research, or sorry, the emergence of the research world seeking partnership with DP, DPOs and families has provided a powerhouse collaboration. This created a surge in progressing policy development that gives me hope to see change where it's so sorely needed. To build back better after a global pandemic requires amplifying the needs of disabled children and youth after what's been such an incredibly challenging time. Ensuring that the CRPD is at the heart of our efforts. I look forward to seeing what we will accomplish together. Thank you. Before I end here, I will introduce our team. Uh, we have, have not just the research team, but our advisory council that represents not only organizations, but as well as youth and families all having a seat at the table. Thank you, Keiko, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much, Rachel. It's uh, so good to have, uh, always great to have your perspectives on this. And uh, Rachel has uh, been engaging on different projects, as you mentioned before. Uh, one of those projects is um, one that will, a few of the projects we will speak about now, with the hopes that we can engage in a conversation at any time. So I just want to uh, reinforce, if you need, uh, if you have comments and, or thoughts, you can put them on chat as we speak. Don't, you don't need to wait to the end. And uh, we'll try to, uh, to intervene between all the speakers. Also, I just want to give a quick check with the interpreters to make sure that everything is OK. Quick pause, because I know we were just rolling. Yes, all good. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, so we'll continue. Uh, with our next speaker um, and uh, we have um, done a series of projects that are uh, using our, the CRPD as a framework for analysis and that's the hope uh, we're trying to uh, act more locally and use this in research as a way to also uh, disseminate and uh, apply these results uh, or the, the convention in different ways that can be applied locally and internationally. Uh, so the, our next speaker is uh, Professor Lim Chuka. He's an associate professor at McGill University and uh, here in Montreal, Canada, has worked on topics of governance for health for the past 15 years. The thrust of his research has been to understand how intersectoral issues impact the pursuit of health policy. One of the threads of uh, his research program has been to examine the factors that shape the implementation of international standards and laws at national and subnational levels. This work has cut across topic areas, including uh, non communicable disease preventions, mental health care, and disability policy. He has consulted extensively with the Framework Convention Secretariat, the governing body of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, and the United Nations Development Program from 2019 to 2021, he served on the panel chair, uh, charged with establishing the first implementation. Hi, Kiko. I'm sorry to interrupt. This is one of the interpreters. If you wouldn't mind just uh, slowing down just a tiny bit um, when you're reading from a script, we would really appreciate it. Thank you. 
Thank you. My apologies. I thought I was reading really slow. That's my 20 times slower than usual. <laughs> my apologies. Okay. I, I was over. So, uh, so Professor Lentuka has uh, been now uh, working in implementation review mechanisms for the, the Convention on Tobacco Control and is one of the co-principal uh, investigators in the project that he will present now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Keiko. It really is an honor to be here and to be presenting on behalf of our team. Um, so I'm what I'm going to be doing today and um, is to provide a bit of a snapshot of the project that we've been working on. And it aligns really closely with the theme of today. We've been looking at the possibility of examining what countries have been doing in terms of their COVID response and using the UNCRPD as a framework to assess to what extent the content of the policies that countries have been implementing have aligned with the content of the UNCRPD. Um, so what we know is that, and this is heartening to see this recognition from the highest level of the United Nations, um, this statement from the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, recognizing that the needs of, of persons with disabilities require attention during an emergency uh, like we've been experiencing with the COVID pandemic. And this has also been taken up by the World Health Organization, uh, this recognition that certain populations, such as those with disability, may be impacted more significantly by COVID-19. And we've seen this where people with chronic health conditions have experienced higher rates of infection and mortality from COVID-19 across different regions of the world. We've seen that the residential situation of individuals who are living with chronic conditions or who are or experiencing some type of vulnerability uh, has served as a risk factor for uh, transmission and infection. And if we look at Article 11 of the UNCRPD, it states that state parties must take all necessary measures to ensure the protection and safety of persons with disabilities in situations of risk. And that's including um, health emergencies that like we've been experiencing with COVID-19. So what we wanted to do, and uh, Professor Shikako will, will um, share a bit more about our methodology, but what I'm, we wanted to do is to look at using this uh, unique approach to examine the content of policies in various countries of the world. And we started with 14 countries to kind of pilot this approach. And we wanted to include different income categories and geographic representations. So we included uh, 14 countries in a, uh, that are represented here on the screen. They include Canada, India, Australia, France, South Africa, Jamaica, Fiji, Philippines, Zimbabwe, Rwanda, Haiti, Malawi, Ireland, and Guinea. And what we wanted to do was to, to look at, again, using this tool of the UNCRPD and other COVID guidelines that had been produced at, within the United Nations system, specifically the World Health Organization, to examine to what extent the content of these policies aligned with the commitments these countries had made to implementing the provisions of the UNCRPD and other measures. And I just wanted to give a bit of a snapshot of the country context. So we see that COVID-19 has hit certain countries harder than others. However, we do know that this has been truly a global pandemic. Um, and there has been waves of infection that have uh, been experienced across different regions. We also know that there, and we kind of um, wanted to examine the extent of this, the differential impact and the differential response from countries in addressing the outbreak itself. So if we look at here, again, this is, uh, drawing from the Oxford COVID-19 uh, database that was generated at the beginning of the pandemic, we look and see that following the initial kind of rise and spike in, in the infection rates in countries, 
countries started to respond to the outbreak. And this is a stringency index made up of various measures, but it gives you an illustration of the extent to which countries implemented measures like mandatory masks, um, restrictions in public places, and later on um, issues like uh, vaccine mandates or these types of things. So, like I said, I'll just provide a, a snapshot of some of our findings. We included 764 policy documents for analysis and the range of and the quantity of policy documents varied across countries. Um, it's important to note that um, while the overall number of policies developed in response to COVID-19 provides some general indication of government action, the nature and quality of the policies require analysis to determine what the extent to which these policies cover the range of needs within the population, and specifically how they address considerations of persons with disabilities. So one of the interesting findings that uh, I wanted to introduce today is that of the countries that we included in our analysis, many had disability specific uh, content in their policies in terms of protections um, and specific measures to meet the needs of persons with disabilities. However, only five countries, uh, and hopefully this, oops. So these five countries, um, had specific policy documents that they produced to meet the uh, targeting individuals who are living with disabilities. So the remaining countries had included possibly content in the more general policies around COVID response, but didn't have a very specific policy document addressing the needs of persons with disabilities. We see in terms of the frequency of terms that came up that and possibly unsurprisingly, we see public health and healthcare and COVID vaccine taking up the kind of primary spots in this, um, the frequency of the terms that were that arose. Um, we see, for example, health services was the most um, coherent topic identified in 86% of the the documents that were analyzed for that particular um, piece of the project um, what i wanted to raise and and this is i think one of the take-home messages from our project is that this analysis actually brought to, to light more questions than it provided answers to so one question that came to mind to me is should we be seeing different phrases in this list should we see education taking a, a more prominent place in the in the discussion should we see issues of community taking a more prominent place so what this methodology allows for is to identify what's being said and then it it leads then hopefully to further analysis to determine exactly what this means for the lives of persons with disabilities and how this how the the policies that were generated impact their lives so i wanted to actually skip over this uh, slide to show um, this particular figure. And this, uh, as you can see on the slide, hopefully, so it's the number of times that each article of the UNCRPD was referenced in policy documents pertaining to specifically to persons with disabilities. And so you can see the articles that were identified most prominently in the analysis. Um, well, what was interesting is that we started to identify the, the different content that was um, produced across the different categories of countries that we included. And what we see is that articles 11, 23, 19, and 24 remain the most commonly captured in our model with uh, across the different income categories except for what we find in low-income countries was we didn't find article 19 being as prominent. So this idea of living independently and all the content associated with that. So these are the types of findings that, that the approach that we took allowed us to identify. 
And just to kind of, again, give a glimpse of the content of some of these policies, what we see is that there is recognition by certain countries that, that persons with disabilities require attention in the policy of the country and may require different um, responses or, or, or services or supports to address the unique needs that they may possess. Um, and we see this in uh, the statements that are being expressed in this, this slide specifically. Um, one finding that we noted is that although some policies recognize the vulnerability of persons with disabilities and flag the need to concentrate efforts to consider this population, um, very few documents outline concrete actions to address these issues beyond just the, simply the recognition of this potential vulnerability. Um, and this may be a virtue of the level of government that we were targeting. So it's possible that countries, for example, like Canada, and we know this about Canada, is that it's a federal system where the provinces have responsibility for a lot of the provision of health services and, and these types of things. So this may simply be a reflection of the level in which we targeted, uh, but it's certainly something that is worth noting. The other last piece that I wanted to illustrate here or highlight um, was this note about including persons with disabilities in the in or so this is more about universal accessibility um, and it, it really very much targeted the services and material material requirements um, that prevent or protect against transmission um, what was again this is partly what uh, our project and our, our team uh, puzzled over is is what was omitted in the policy documents. So one question that we that remains is what other types of communities supports would be required or needed in an emergency response? Do, do, does this emphasis on the kind of measures that prevent transmission or protect individuals from uh, acquiring the virus, is that sufficient or there or is there more that's required? So in terms of a few take home messages, like I said, we ended up with more questions than we uh, have answers to. Um, we, so I'll, I'll, I'll just end by noting some of these. Um, what our analysis didn't capture is resource allocation. So one thing that we could ask is to what extent do budgets reflect the needs of persons with disabilities during an emergency? We don't know that yet. Um, to what to what extent, and I think this is what relates so well to this theme, is to what extent do in, international standards shape the national or subnational decision making process? Um, and one thing that we did notice and and requires a bit further analysis is to look at to what extent individual who are living with disabilities, to what extent were they, were they included in the process of decision making to address the needs of communities? And then another piece related to government governance is to what extent does the governance structure of countries shape disability specific response? So, for example, to what extent does having a disability specific advisory committee um, improve the response, um, emergency response for these communities? Um, and then including persons with disabilities in the planning and decision making, as I had mentioned. So again, that, that's a snapshot of some of the things that we found. And I wanna pick up on Rachel's um, final note and, and thank everyone who has been involved in this project. And we've benefited so much from having such a diverse group of people um, as part of the conversation. We want to sincerely thank them. Thank you, uh, Rafael. We, um, we have a few uh, requests that we, uh, we will attend to now. Uh, so, so we do have, uh, we do need a, a short break uh, for our interpreters. 
And uh, so we'll make um, a five minute break, if that's okay, uh, to just refresh and uh, we'll come back to continue. Uh, we will also figure out, we, uh, we are honored to have um, Janet in. We had a, after a little a bit of issue with time, but we will uh, then take a break. We'll come back and uh, we'll continue with the with uh, Janet, Lord, and uh, the research findings from the other projects. Okay, so it's uh, 1 03 uh, Eastern time. Five minute break is good. So uh, we'll go, we'll come back at 1 08 in five minutes. Okay, thank you so much. that uh, created the ad hoc committee that ultimately led to our work uh, drafting the convention and and then finally its adoption um, I guess 15 years ago and Steve it's interesting we talked at the time about the sort of triple challenge I think as we saw it we knew that we had a sort of steep mountain to climb and that not only were we trying to incorporate disability and disability rights into the mainstream of human rights work where it had been you know really neglected or all but invisible but i think we also realized um most definitely at the time that we were also working to change and shift uh the approach to international development as well as humanitarian assistance so we i think we knew uh, at the time that we were wanting to integrate disability and a disability rights sensibility into not only human rights but also uh, humanitarian assistance and development and i don't think uh, we could have imagined i certainly couldn't have imagined the progress that that we've made we have a long way to go but it's i don't think we quite could have imagined that we would make progress on all three of those fronts um, as quickly as we did and i think the irony for me steve we met as you said during the uh, mine ban treaty sort of implementation process so the ottawa convention had been adopted and we were working to ensure that the voice of landmine survivors was heard uh, in that process and that landmine survivors were visible in that process. And it was a, of course, as you know, Steve, having participated from the very early stage of the mine ban process, it was a, a real effort to um, ensure that the rights of survivors were reflected in that instrument. It was not something that was thought necessary and indeed there was resistance to it. Um, and the funny thing is we're still fighting for, I think, a disability rights approach to uh, victim assistance and, and the mind ban treaty process. I think we have a long way to go still. Um, so I find that a little bit ironic um, and what we still have work to do. But I do think that um, from my perspective, both as an international, uh, disability rights lawyer and as someone who uh, practices in the area of disability inclusive development and also to some ex extent humanitarian assistance that we've made progress on all of those fronts that we have um, not only law and policy change at the within states we have the un disability strategy we have uh, the world bank and many other donors and organizations adopting disability uh, disability Disability policies, rights-based approaches to disability, um, and that is new and exciting. And you know, we're working hard across the world 
disability organizations are working hard across the world to actually take those policies uh, and practices and implement them effectively into uh, into the work. So long way to go, but I couldn't have imagined it. Uh, and I think it's particularly interesting that Article 32, which was a hard fought article in the treaty, the one that reflects the need to and the commitment to disability inclusive development, and also Article 11, another hard fought provision that relates to humanitarian assistance um, and integration of the rights of persons with disabilities in, in all dimensions where, where they are at risk. Um, we, you know, we've made some considerable progress, even though those, the those two provisions were uh, rather controversial during the drafting of the treaty. Um, and I think finally, to draw it back to uh, COVID, COVID has put into sharp relief that we have a long way to go. Um, that persons with disabilities are uh, still left behind. Um, certainly in my country, in the United States, institutionalization of people with disabilities has meant that persons with disabilities are more isolated, uh, but also more at risk for contracting COVID. Um, and uh, that is a challenge. And the, the worry is that the progress we're making with regard to disability inclusive development, the sustainable development goals, um, is is unfortunately the worry is is that it's being uh, reinforced or we're we're going backwards as a result of the impact of the of the global pandemic. So um, kudos to to you all for doing that really important work. I think I'll leave it at there, Steve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet. All was interested to hear what you have to say, and now as they say on TV. We should go back to our regularly scheduled programming. Okay. Thanks again. And thank you, Kiko, for your flexibility. Thank you so much, uh, Janet. It's so uh, interesting to see uh, the, the contributions and the, the development, right, of how things came to be and where they are now. Um, it's a, I think it's a wonderful process to, to follow, and it's good to know how. Uh, how hard it was to accomplish each one of you know each one of the articles, each aspect of it. Uh, and it's a good way to uh, to introduce us to ways that we are trying to use that in in research and advocacy and in supporting uh, persons with disabilities and family and uh, and families and policies. Um, before uh, and I don't know if you can stay for the next part, but just so before uh, we go back to the the other uh, research uh, part. I wanted to know, uh, just invite if anyone has any uh, thoughts, comments, questions uh, to um, share with Janet. And I don't want it to put on, on the spot. Janet. We will, what I'll ask people to, uh, to put on the chat uh, if you have any uh, questions and, uh, or comments for, uh, for, for Janet. And uh, I will be, uh, will be happy to, to address it back if you can stay for a little bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's good. Yes, I'm here for the conclusion of, of the whole event. So thank you so much. Okay, that's great. Excellent. Thank you so much. So uh, we uh, will be happy to uh, to relate uh, questions uh, later on. We'll try to advance. We are very late in our agenda. Uh, so we'll try to accommodate and uh, have everything on. We really wanted to have the space for dialogue. So please, as you have any thoughts and ideas, do put them on the chat so we can try to uh, to have a dynamic dialogue, although I know it's hard with the interpret for the interpreters to manage there, but we'll try to uh, have this conversation ongoing on the chat as we move along to the presentations, okay? So um, another uh, slight change of schedule because of the time too. So we'll have uh, our next speaker uh, will be uh, Dr. Rubab uh, Arin. Uh, she's the Chief uh, in the Social Analysis and Modeling Division at Statistics Canada. Uh, her research expertise includes the use of population-based survey and administrative data to study policy-relevant issues for vulnerable populations. That includes the children and youth with disabilities uh, with a particular focus on social determinants of health. Recently, uh, she has been involved in Statistics Canada's Disaggregated Data Action Plan to better highlight the experiences of children and youth with disabilities with an emphasis on better data for better decision making. So thank you, Hubab, for making uh, to our meeting. The floor is yours. 
Thank you, Keiko. So I'm going to try to share my screen very quickly here. And please let me know if you can see my screen. The title slide? Not yet. <laughs> we can't see it. Uh, Alex, uh, can you help? <laughs> yes, I can share. Thank you for that. Well, I'm going to start while the, the slides are, you know, being up. Um, it's truly a great honor, a truly a great pleasure to be here today with all of you. Um, as many presenters uh, mentioned since the beginning of the, um, of the meeting, we've come a long way um, despite the unique challenges to many around the globe. Um, but uh, I, I'd like to add that we also have um, a lot more work to do um, to accomplish. So as the statistical agency of the nation, um, certainly the COVID-19 pandemic brought many challenges, um, but what we really achieved during the pandemic was that um, it was a period to show our resiliency, our responsiveness, our agility. So in addition to some of the ongoing um, survey programs, um, the well, most well-known Canadian Community Health Survey, um, Canadian Health Survey on Children and Youth, as well as uh, most of you may know, um, Canadian Survey on Disability. In addition to these um, survey collections, we started two new data collection series, namely Canadian Perspectives um, study series, as well as impacts of uh, COVID-19 on Canadians data collection series. So because of our time limits, I am not going to um, the into the details of some of the results. Um, they are on our websites, they are in various um, uh, publications from our website, um, but I do, I would like to highlight two things. Um, namely, number one, we know that youth mental health specifically has been very much impacted by uh, the COVID-19 pandemic as well as um, parents or families of children with disabilities were especially vulnerable to the impacts of COVID-19 as well. That's what our data showed. Um, but as I mentioned, um, we really uh, do need to look forward. And in terms of uh, moving forward, what I'd like to highlight today is actually um, two different new initiatives, ongoing initiatives, one being early learning and childcare, and the other one being the segregated data action plan. So for early learning and childcare initiative, we would like to address information needs to ensure an inclusive and accessible early learning and childcare for children with disabilities in Canada. And for disaggregated data action plan, we really um, would like to highlight the experiences of Canadians with disabilities and meet their data needs. And to be able to do that, we are going to continue our enhanced engagement and communication. Uh, we are going to expand on our data with increased access, with increased analytical insights, and of course, with a promotion of national statistical um, standards. So I'll stop there. That was the end of uh, my um, slides. But if you do have any questions, any, um, any information needs, please do not hesitate to contact me at my email address, rubabarim at stackend.gc.ca. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rubab, <laughs> for the quick overview. This is uh, amazing. I encourage everyone to contact and also add your comments, questions uh, to the chat. Um, I know we are, um, our time is really short, and uh, we'll try to give a quick overview of, um, of the other projects. Uh, so, uh, again, I encourage you to really 
please go ahead and ask, uh, uh, put your questions on the on the chat so we can hopefully engage in a little bit of a dialogue, although we won't have uh, too much time at this moment, but uh, we'll try. <laughs> So um, I'll present to you quickly, very quickly, the, the results uh, of our project, uh, the project that uh, Rachel introduced earlier on, the Nothing Without Us uh, Towards Inclusive, Equitable COVID-19 Policy Responses for Youth with Disabilities and Their Families. Uh, our team has been introduced and you're all there. Um, so this project was uh, done in the context of a call from CIHR for the Canadian Institutes of Health Research to create uh, COVID uh, responses or to study in uh, COVID issues for different populations. Our target group was uh, children and youth with disabilities and their families. And uh, what we wanted to consider in this project was this aspect of how children uh, are in this intersectionality group uh, between women, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, different vulnerabilities that they are exposed to. And in particular, we have an emphasis on mental health. So what were the uh, essential services and uh, during and post the pandemic uh, for, uh, for the recovery? I will try to slow down, I was warned. <laughs> okay, uh, so we used the UNCRPD as a framework uh, for equity and uh, comprehensiveness and in particularly we used uh, the bridge the gap indicators um, which were uh, promoted by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights as a way to understand uh, which were the structures, process and potential outcomes in the, in the implementation process as applied for mental health policies during COVID in Canada. So a few issues that we know were important for children uh, or for youth with disabilities was um, the lack of schools, so the school closures and the decreased access to physical education, more screen time, disrupted routines and uh, a lot of different activities that children could not partake. And knowing that in previous pandemics or humanitarian emergencies, there was issues related to post-traumatic stress disorders for children and uh, also for um, other issues related to mental health in the post uh, of these conditions, of these uh, pandemics and events. We wanted to then identify which were the policies that were uh, done by the provinces in Canada and also what are the families needs uh, identified uh, in the different uh, provinces, what are the most pressing needs that families perceived. We collect data from June 2020 to June 2021 with a mental health focus across provinces. Uh, documents that were uh, promoted by the different provinces and territories and both guidelines and services and resources that were uh, promoted. What we used then, uh, we created a mental health analytical framework using uh, word stat and tax mining techniques. And uh, we also created a COVID-19 model and we also did a content analysis doing a close read at those policies. To give you a quick sense of uh, the, we had articles, each of the articles of the UNCRPD and the indicators as uh, proposed by the OHCHR. And uh, those indicators, we transformed them into an analytical model that we used to look into those policies. There was a total of 362 policy documents and uh, the most uh, cited ones or the most frequent ones or those related to uh, Article 24, 11, and 19. And uh, we saw that there was a specific guidance for, uh, or specific mention, sorry, of a different articles, but in particular aspects related to services and mostly guidance uh, for different uh, services to be structured. Examples are from Article 11, so students with special needs and students at risk may require additional supports. This article uh, in the text that related to this article, article also cited the need to share decision making and to have inclusive environments uh, in the different school settings. We uh, also in relation to habilitation and habilitation, we saw a lot of different uh, guidance and policies speaking about the need to integrate services that are offered in the school setting with those that are usually off offered in the health settings and uh, specifically guidance providing uh, for inclusive action in this intersection. In terms of COVID, we see that uh, the policies mention a lot about symptoms and outcomes, 
not so much or a little bit more about stressors and then other barriers like attitudinal medical and structural barriers are not mentioned that often in the policies that we um, that we identified so i'll skip to the highlights um we looking closing to uh, closely into some of the policies from some provinces we identified that most directions they are around creating safe environments but we saw that there was a lack of an overarching policy framework and limited considerations for this intersection between mental health and disabilities and children and youth. Um, highlighting some uses of aspects like ethical decision making frameworks and some intersections when uh, governments provided guidance for families or for service providers on how to address the specific needs of children in this context. Um, either by providing better communication strategies or filling um, other ways of providing other services that were absolutely necessary. So um, we will um, I'll stop here and I'll give the floor to Ash, who will speak on the uh, briefly on the interviews that we conducted with families. Ash is the um, uh, Master of Public Policy from the School of Public Policy in at the University of Calgary. He works with Jennifer Zwicker, who is the other co-principal investigator in this project, and he was the research associate um, who focused on research and health policy. And he will speak uh, on the needs identified by the families uh, in this uh, project. Thank you, Ash. Thank you, Kiko. Uh, I'm honored and humbled to share some of the uh, underpinnings and key findings from the uh, objective just described by the Kiko. And uh, just very quickly that uh, we wanted to determine uh, experiences of uh, families and youth with neurodevelopmental disabilities accessing services and mental health needs, particularly during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, to accomplish our objectives, we began our journey by defining our cohorts of interest. Uh, cohort one was parents and caregivers of youth with neurodevelopmental disabilities uh, who aged between 0 to 30 years. And cohort two was uh, youth with neurodevelopmental disabilities itself, uh, aged 18 to 30 years inclusively. Uh, and this study utilized a mixed methods approach where we collected and analyzed both qualitative and quantitative data. Um, because we are short on time, we'll be happy to share an e-link of our study finding summary after this event. Um, for the phase one of the study, we interviewed 40 parents and caregivers. And uh, uh, for the second phase of the study, we captured the experiences of youth, uh, again, for youth who were uh, recruited to various social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. Um, in terms of our results, uh, the results uh, enabled us to understand how disruptions, delays, and denials of the services brought about by the pandemic disproportionately impacted youth and their families relative to the general population. Uh, um, to give you a brief um, we found that service disruptions negatively impacted parents' ability to access services and support for their children. For example, children's schooling and medical services, including therapies and counseling. Uh, with regards to delays, we heard that parents uh, experienced longer than expected delays in seeking healthcare services like general physicians, uh, referral appointments, and surgeries. And um, for denials, we heard that many families were denied access to visit their loved ones in hospitals and group homes. Um, such interruptions in access to services profoundly impacted families. Uh, for instance, parents were worried about their children's mental health and development. Uh, they found that there is an increase in children's social anxiety and regression in academic development progress compared to pre-pandemic levels. Um, families also felt financial strain due to changes in the employment status and increased costs of accessing supplies. Um, the impacts were also experienced in the caregiving capacity of families. Many families mentioned that they experienced competing demands of caretaking, caretaking managing children's online schooling and work from home. Um, the negative impacts of disruption also resulted in unbalancing of family unit as it brought along unexpected changes in the daily routine of parents and their children, along with the loss of social connections. 
Uh, in addition to parents and caregivers, as I mentioned, we also interviewed youth with neurodevelopmental disabilities. We are still analyzing these results, but thought we would provide you a quick snapshot of the preliminary results emerging out of our study. Um, the results uh, enabled us to understand the impact in various areas of COVID-19 policies like access to services, education, employment, and mental health. Uh, just to give you some brief snapshots, uh, many youth face disruptions and delays in accessing medical services, particularly mental health counseling. Um, for education, youth mentioned that they were concerned about their academic scores and success. Uh, we also talked to youth about their employment and they reported job losses and reduction in work hours, which affected their uh, financial well-being. Um, and with respect to stressors that impacted mental health, many youth reported the loss of social connections and face challenges in meeting friends and family. Um, other stressors were fear of catching COVID-19 infection outside their homes, of staying at hospitals without loved ones. Uh, precautionary measures like wearing masks because of uh, medical barriers was another mental health stressor. And consequently, these stressors resulted in various mental health symptoms like increased anxiety, panic attacks, uh, more isolation, um, uh, disturbances in sleep patterns and overall functioning uh, as compared to pre-pandemic levels. Um, so we are confident uh, that the findings from this study will provide critical uh, insights for a disability inclusive recovery policies and programs that integrate the needs of youth with disabilities and their families for a safe re-entry into the society particularly in the situations of risk and humanitarian emergencies. Um, I appreciate your attention and hope you enjoy the rest of the policy dialogue. Thank you, Ash. Um, those are, I am really, really, uh, it's, I'm really sorry that we are we're running so late uh, and we're having to speed up at this. And I know that our interpreters have to go because um, this was the, uh, beyond already the time that we had uh, agreed on. So I will ask people uh, if you can stay um, on uh, a few more minutes. We had technically another short presentation from the WHO report on disabilities from Dr. Elsa Bag, but we may um, have to skip it, which uh, we will suggest we did want to engage on a little bit of a conversation, but as I said, I just need to, uh, the interpreters need to go. Um, so if we have um, anyone using interpretation, um, please can, if you can signal on the chat so that we uh, can decide if we uh, can let our interpreters go or if we can stay a few more minutes. Someone is saying something. Uh, uh, someone asked for the recording, yes. We'll make the link available. So what we'll do, um, we'll make the, the link available uh, with the recording of the presentations. And uh, also all of the, a summary, we'll make a brief of all the summary uh, of all the presentations today, including the, the presentation on WHO report uh, by Dr. Rebsebeck that we could not um, as, uh, attend. So um, I'm not seeing anyone say anything on the chat. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I will, uh, I'll do two things I'll ask. Uh, yes, thank you, our interpreters. Uh, I think you can go. Thank you so much. Uh, my apologies for the very confusing setup. Um, what I'll ask you all uh, to, to stay a few more minutes. Uh, so please do complete the survey. Uh, you see the link um, on the chat. If you could complete, it would be really helpful uh, to, uh, to help us um, reflect a little bit on what was done today. Um, and if you have any questions uh, to ask, uh, Roberta is also reminding me uh, if we could ask permission for a picture. So yes, if we could, if you feel comfortable, I'll ask everyone to, take, to put their cameras on. And uh, two things, as you smile, uh, so if, if you're okay with having your pictures taken, please uh, turn on your camera and we'll try to make screenshots of uh, pictures made on, on this in age. Um, I will ask you uh, if you have anyone has any comments, questions, you could also 
after the picture, <laughs> you can uh, unmute your mics and um, we could uh, have a little bit of time for, uh, for a dialogue. Um, okay, so I will do, uh, as Steve also has to go. Okay, so Steve, let's stay for the picture <laughs> and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up, okay? Um, Roberta, are you doing the screenshots? I hope, oh, yes, okay. So, uh, okay, thank you everyone for turning on your cameras. <laughs> this is nice. Um, okay, so uh, smile <laughs> and uh, what we'll do then, so please complete the survey, we will we'll make a summary. Thank you so much everyone uh, for joining us today and uh, for uh, sharing your expertise uh, for uh, our guest speakers uh, who really made the time to, to come. This is really, was amazing. Maybe. Unfortunately, we didn't have much time for discussion, um, but it's um, we'll, we'll have hopefully other opportunities. Please do send your email uh, if you want to receive uh, the summary of today and the link uh, for the recording. And hopefully we'll try to engage in conversations in uh, other ways uh, in the future. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for the technical, for my team, uh, everyone there, Roberta, uh, Alex, uh, and Shanania, it was amazing. Thank you so much for the hard work on the backstage. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day. <laughs>